So before we get started, I gotta know, who is doing active work on a desktop application right now? That's a lot of people. So WinForms, WPF, UWP, oh, no one, okay. Um, has anyone ever done UWP? Just to find out what, what, what we're having. Okay, okay good, good. Um, one more question. Are you or the company you're working for planning on starting to develop a new application, a new desktop application? Only one? Yeah, a couple? Okay. Um, so in my opinion, the desktop applications, of course, still have a reason to be. Not, uh, not everything is better on the web. Uh, but that's a discussion for a whole other session. I can keep going on about this. Uh, today we're going to dive into the Windows app SDK. Um, this is me. My name is Nico. I'm from Belgium, um, where I'm an application architect at a company called Inutum Real Dolman. We're a consultancy company. I've been an MVP in WinDev since 2014. Uh, I run a user group in Belgium where we're focusing on um, developing front-end applications using the Microsoft stack. Um, we actually started out as the Windows Phone user group in Belgium, and we still miss it. Um, apparently, I brew beer. I drink it as well. I wrote a book on .NET 6, which has been available with APRES since March, I believe. This is my Twitter handle. Feel free to follow me to send me any follow-up questions after the session, uh, or just have a chat in general. What are we doing today? We're going to have a look at the Windows App SDK. Uh, what's in there? What is it? What's it? What it's all about? Um, the different components, and then of course we'll dive into demos as soon as possible. But we cannot do that before we have a look what's in there. So the Windows App SDK uh, was previously known as Project Reunion. And people I talk to, uh, a lot of them don't know the Windows App SDK, never heard of it. But if I mention Project Reunion, then that all of a sudden rings a bell. Uh, so the, the big idea was we have these um, different desktop frameworks. We have WPF, we have WinForms, we have UWP. Each has their own strengths. Let's bring everything together under a unified API. That was the promise of Project Reunion. Um, in the SDK are a set of components, tools, APIs, uh, controls, and so on. Um, they sell it as the next evolution in desktop development, uh, which basically means that it's yet again a new target type in Visual Studio to write a desktop application. It's not WPF, it's not WinForms, it's not UWP, it's something new, uh, based on all those previous frameworks altogether. Um, it's released through NuGet, which means that it's completely decoupled from Windows now, which was a big problem of WPF. Uh, if a bug was found in WPF or UWP, there had to be a Windows update in order to fix it. So those frameworks were tied to the update cadence of the operating system which they decided to decouple. So now everything's released through NuGet. We're currently at version 1.0.3 and 1.1 is in preview. Um, I don't know when 1.1 will be released, uh, but they are releasing preview versions quite often. Um, also, the roadmap is out there on GitHub. Um, this thing is open source, so you can just look it up. The roadmap is, is out there. Uh, the discussion happens fully on GitHub as well. So if you are interested in this, you can join the discussion there. So what do we have? Um, a couple of things. And the biggest one is missing from this list. Uh, that's because that's on the next slide. It gets a slide all of its own. Uh, so we have the DWrite core, which means that we can render text. Uh, we can render text in a way that it looks very good on all different kind of monitors, DPIs, resolutions, and so on. Really sharp text everywhere. This is not really an API that we directly use. It's just one of the underlying techniques that, uh, that's in the framework. There's the MRT, MRT core, which is the resources, like translations. Um, that's in there. We can do app instancing. 
uh, like do you want your app to only have one instance? Um, an example of this one is the, uh, the mail app in Windows. If you open the mail app and you minimize it and you open it again through whatever shortcut, it will just maximize the, the instance that's already there. So that's something we can do. Uh, that's rich activation, meaning we can launch our app from a protocol uh, or a specific file type, which might come in handy if you're writing editors for whatever type. Um, power management means that we can get events in case of battery drain or low battery, and we can uh, have our application be less active in the background. We can do windowing, uh, we can do push notifications, and there's deployment. Um, one small thing about push notifications, that's currently in pre-release, uh, not in the stable version yet. So that's why I don't have a demo of that one. Uh, they're still working on it. And a, lo a lot of things they are still working on. So they, they decided to release the FSDK quite early and be very upfront with what, what they're doing, doing out in the open. Uh, so that's why you have certain things not, not working yet or missing or stuff like that. Um, for those who have dabbled into UWP, a lot of these things might seem uh, recognizable. The deployment story is basically the same thing. We can deploy through MSIX, which we'll get back into further in the presentation. Um, the big difference is that UWP was really aimed to be a mobile framework, to live in a sandbox, to, to have a lot of, um, to, to protect the system from, from the user, basically. Um, that, that has changed a lot with the Windows app SDK. We can run in full trust again. We can do interop again, uh, while still using the modern controls that were introduced with UWP. So it really is a mix of the, the best of all those worlds. This is the big one I was missing from the list, uh, WinUI 3. Uh, who has heard of WinUI? Not a lot of people, okay. Um, WinUI was the idea of, of taking uh, XAML, the XAML controls in the Windows runtime or UWP, take those out and ship them separately from the OS. So we're not talking about the APIs and, and all the systems that we just discussed, we're talking about the controls, the XAML controls in there. Um, that was WinUI, take it out, have it separately uh, on Nougat, be able to update it whenever needed, and so forth. Um, so we, the first WinUI was, uh, well, was a nice start, and then came WinUI 2, which introduced XAML Islands. And XAML Islands was a technique where we could embed the modern controls, like the, the mapping control, the inking canvas, and so on. We could embed that in other application types, like WinForms we could embed UWP XAML controls in a WinForms application to modernize our applications. Um, because application modernization is a big thing these days. And this would be a nice new first step into modernizing. Um, the browser control is a nice example of that one as well. Uh, and I have a demo of this later on. If you use the WebView control or the browser control in WinForms, you get IE10, I believe which is kind of obsolete. Uh, so using XAML Islands, you can actually use the new Edge browser in your WinForms application. And you don't even need to run on .NET 5 or 6. 4.8 is supported. Um, so WinUI 3 was the next version. Uh, and what is the big part in the Windows application SDK? Uh, together with the list on the previous slide, it forms the entire SDK. That, that's the complete thing. XAML Islands, as I just mentioned, is not yet in WinUI 3. That's it's still only in, in version 2. They're working on it again. Uh, so meaning if you want your modern controls in your older legacy application, you need to fall back to WinUI 2 for those. Um, as for languages that are supported, we have C++ support, C Sharp, VB, and even JavaScript through React Native for Windows. This is the GitHub repository for uh, WinUI. That's where you can find all that discussion. Uh, WinUI is bundled in the application SDK, but it's kind of like a separate product because it's so big. All right, let's have a look. 
If you have any questions, by the way, feel free to ask. Okay, so the first demo I'm going to do, I'm going to show a couple of things that I picked out of the, the list. Um, the first one is about the MRT, the, the resourcing uh, toolkit. Um, is that big enough for people in the back? A bit small? Let's do it like this then. Okay, so what, what I did, I didn't write these samples myself. Um, on the App SDK repository in GitHub, there are a lot of samples there. Uh, so I'm just using those and walking you through the codes that they are using. Um, so we have here a very simple um, App SDK uh, application. If I click the default language, we get a string down here that says English sample. I can override it with some German fall back to a legacy system, or even load it from a resource that's in a class library. That's all that, that this does. Um, let's look at some codes. Looking at the solution, we have three projects uh, in there, in the solution. We have a class library that has a simple class and a resource file in the form of a RESW. We have a desktop application this is a project type Windows app SDK uh, app, or WinUI app, basically. Uh, this one has a legacy resource file, a ResX, uh, and new one as well, the ResW, uh, both in English and in German. Uh, this is the app package. Don't worry about that yet. We will discuss that uh, later on. Okay, looking at those resources files. So the legacy one, the ResX, uh, people that have done translations in desktop applications probably know this, right? Uh, it's just the um, key value pair. Looking at the new types, that's basically the same thing. The, the way that they're structured, uh, that the files are structured is a bit different. The way of working is the same. So what happens? Um, uh, let's start here. So we initialize a resource loader and a resource manager. And on the resource manager, we have a resource not found event. Should we try to load in a resource? It cannot be found. We can use this event to fall back onto a, a more legacy system. And that's what they're doing with the ResX file. So if, if we're trying to find a, um, a key that's not in the ResW, we fall back to the ResX. Uh, if it's not found there, we can do some other things, and so on. So once these are initially, uh, initialized, we initialize the main window. We pass in the resource loader and the resource manager. Jumping to the main window, we click the button, and we use the resource loader to get the string called sample string. Going back to the RESW file, this is the sample string that we're fetching. Your basic resource management system. We can also override it um, by going to a very specific um, resources file, uh, also called resources in this case. Uh, and we're passing in the context, this one. This switches the language to German. And that's why all of a sudden we get the, the German translation there. Um, so you need to pass in the correct language key, and it will use that to find the correct file, load the string from there, and show it on screen. As for the fallback, we can load in a different um, resource map from the resource manager, uh, try to fetch it. It will not find this, and it will go through the event handler that we just defined in the app.saml.cs, where it will fall back to the ResX system and load the string from there. Um, so that's, that's uh, how easy this is. Um, all right, let's start a new project. So if you want to start a new project that makes use of the Windows application SDK, the best thing you can do is go for the WinUI project. 
Um, now, before you get these templates, you, you have some work to do. Uh, you need to install some workloads in Visual Studio. You need to install the VC++ version something something. You need to install uh, specific desktop development workloads, specific versions of .NET. And then you need to install a Visual Studio extension. Simple, right? One click of a button. Uh, once you have done all those, then you get these project types and then they also actually work. The entire list of what you need to do is on the Microsoft website. Uh, I've put it in my resources at the end of the presentation. Um, but yeah, I, I'm hoping that they will one day have a one-click installer or something, which would be nice. Okay, so we have a couple of project types here. First one, blank app packaged to WinUI 3 in desktop. So what this does is um, it gives you a template with a WinUI 3 library already referenced. Um, and it will give you a um, MSIX package as well, meaning that you can just um, create an installer for your application and just ship it out. Again, MSIX coming up later in this presentation. Uh, what else do we have? We have a class library, which we all know, of course. And then we have a blank app packaged with a Windows application packaging project. Um, the Windows application packaging project is uh, what we used back in UWP days for creating our app package to upload to the Windows Store or the Microsoft Store. Um, it's still here for backwards compatibility purposes, um, but this basically gives you a solution with two projects, your actual app and your installer, which you don't really need anymore. If you take the topmost um, template, project template, then you will get uh, a solution with one project uh, ready to be packaged as an MSIX as well, which makes maintaining it a bit easier. Oh, wrong button. Uh, let's try that again. New project, blank app packaged. Go app five sounds like a reasonable name. There we go. This is what we're getting. Anyone who has done a XAML-based application sometime in their life will recognize a lot of these things. We have the app.xaml, which is the entry point of the application. We have the main window.xaml, which is the first window to be shown in the application. And then there's the AppX manifest file. Uh, this is what used to be in the installer project, uh, which is now included in the main project so it can generate an MSIX package. So to debug this, we can do two things. We can debug it packaged, we can debug it unpackaged. Um, if you do it packaged, then you debug using all the limitations that MSIX brings you, which are a couple and we'll get to them. If you go for unpackaged, then this is basically similar to a WPF application that you're debugging. Uh, and I mean that in, in the form of um, uh, things you can do, the permissions that your application has on the operating system. If we run this, it should show a nice window with a button that changes its label as soon as you click it. Um, once you have it up and running, you get this toolbar up here um, to inspect your visual tree and to uh, do some live editing and stuff, which is really cool. Uh, but we're not going to go into that in this talk. Looking at the XAML, um, this, sound, this all looks so similar to whatever you're used to. Uh, with, with that difference that the namespaces are now all coming from Microsoft UI.xaml which is the WinUI namespace. This used to be um, system.something or windows.something. Uh, now it's all Microsoft UI XAML, uh, no longer tied to the Windows namespace. I'm not saying that this runs on Linux, which it doesn't. And then we have the, uh, what's it called again? Uh, 
why isn't there? There it is. Uh, so there's this uh, sample application on the Microsoft Store that basically shows all the components that are in WinUI 3. You can use this to, to find out if WinUI 3 has what you need to build your application. Um, for example, let's go to uh, collections. Let's try a list view. There we go. So you get an, uh, an example of a list view in action and you even get some XAML and C Sharp snippets uh, on how this specific sample was constructed. So a really nice application to have around uh, when you start experimenting with WinUI and the Windows App SDK. Uh, it's fairly downloadable on the Microsoft Store. All right, moving on. Let's go for the second demo. Uh, so this is about app activation. Um, as I've mentioned in the beginning, app activation is all about uh, different ways to launch your application. Of course, you can click on the icon and then it launches, or you can double click a file to open it, or you can use a protocol to open your application. And all of these are capabilities within the Windows App SDK. Um, so again, this is a project using both uh, uh, an installer package and a normal WinUI project. If I run this, this does nothing special. It just shows an application. And this tells me how this was launched. So activation kind launch means that I clicked the shortcut and the application started. That's it. If, however, um, do I have it still open? Is it like this? If I open this in File Explorer, we have a couple of files here with the extension foo. If I double click this, it opens the same application. Activation info tells me that this was, the application was activated using a file, and the file name is under there as well. So how did this happen? Looking at the application, um, we found out that we have a uh, AppX manifest file. If we open that, we get into an editor. Um, that editor can do a lot of things. Uh, you can say if your app should react on orientation changes for screens and so on. You can set the icons, the title and whatnot. Um, but in the declarations, we add, we've added two declarations. So one of them is a file type association. Um, this is the logo that the files of this specific type should get. Uh, looking back in Windows Explorer, you see that these got the, the typical square with the cross inside, uh, which is the basic empty icon for any UWP app and WinUI app now. So they get that same logo. Um, this is the name. And then down here, we add the actual file type. So as soon as this application launches once, it uh, tells Windows to bind this file extension to this application. Double click it to open in Windows. Windows uh, remembers the association, opens your app, pass, passes in the file as an argument. And then it's up to you as a developer to make sure the file gets loaded in, you and whatever you want to do with it actually happens. Um, So this does not happen here, it happens here. So this is the code behind the, the button that I clicked in the application that shows how it was activated. Um, and this is also how you can pull in the file that was, open, that was used to open your app and to get some information out of it. So we have an app instance. Um, is, is this code large enough? People in the back? No? Okay, let me zoom in a bit. So we have an app instance. Um, using that app instance, we can get the arguments that were used to activate this app or this instance of the app. From there, we can get the activation kind, which is what we've shown in the application. Uh, activation kind launch or file we've seen so far. If the data in those arguments are of type launch arcs, launch, not launch, 
um, then we know that it was launched by clicking an icon or by uh, a shortcut. Um, and then we just uh, put a message that says um, launch kind launch or activation kind launch. Uh, if it is a file, on the other hand, we can uh, use the file activated event arcs to get the files that were used to open this application. Uh, and then we get an iStorage item, which contains the full path and the file name and everything. So we can uh, use this to then use the Windows API to actually load in the file. And for example, if you're building a, a photo viewer, you can show the image. Or a markdown editor, you can just load it in, load the content, and you're good to go. And then there's a third one. Um, that says protocol. Looking back at our um, declarations, there is a protocol declaration as well. Uh, and it's called foo. Meaning, if I do Windows R to get the run dialog, I do this, foo um, colon slash slash, hit OK. My application launches and the protocol was used. Why would you ever do this? Uh, because, for example, you can build a website that can use that protocol to launch your application. I click that link. The browser will say, your website is trying to open this specific application. Would you like it to? He said, yes, and the application starts. Um, if you ever used any Office documents on SharePoint, OneDrive, whatnot, they use the exact same thing. You click it, they ask if you want to open Word or Excel uh, in, in the application. They use a protocol to do this. You can pass, um, uh, th th that's what, what's behind the link here, there's an argument. You can catch that in your application as well and use it to, do, to trigger specific actions. Sure. Yeah, 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 sure, of course. Okay, so the question is, uh, would your application need to have run once uh, in order to register the protocol? Uh, yes, it does. You, you need to run it in order for the, the declarations to have worked. Uh, so, so a brand new user clicks on the link on the website for the first time, it's not going to launch. Uh, so a brand new user that clicks for the first time on the website uh, will probably not even have the app installed. So would we need to redirect it to the installer first? If it is installed and you never launched it before, then it wouldn't be able to recognize it. For now, that might change, but there, there needs to be some point on where the application registers itself with Windows. Okay, moving on. The next demo um, is about app instancing. And looking at the demo uh, in a minute, it will look very similar to the one we just did with activations. Uh, in fact, it, it's exactly the same, with that difference that instead of using the foo extension, we now we are using the moo extension. Uh, so we have activation kind launch, it was called from main, um, jumping into explorer into the instancing. So same thing again, two files, small difference in extension. We open it, we get an instance of the application. Okay. Going back, we open the second file, we get a second instance of the application. Right? Makes sense. Um, if I now reopen this first file, wh whose instance is still open in the back, it just passes it through, through to the existing instance. And th that's what this is about. We are checking if there's already an instance of our application running that has this specific file loaded. If the answer is yes, then we just reactivate that instance, pass in the selected file, and then we can do stuff. This works through here. 
So this application starts in program.cs, uh, where we, of course, have a, uh, a main method. Uh, info. We have an unactivated uh, event handler. Um, if it was launched by clicking the icon, um, activation kind launched, then we just start a new instance, no problem. If it was activated through a file, uh, we need to check um, if that file is already open in, an, in a different instance. Uh, so that's what we're doing here. Uh, this site redirection, this is the one. Okay, so we're getting the file name and we are using it uh, to find or register an instance. A specific instance of your app uh, can be registered using a key. And as key, we are using the file name in this instance. So by using find or register for key, um, we get an object back, a key instance, with a property that says is current. Is current is true if we have registered uh, this instance. If we have not registered it, is current is false means that this instance already exists and we need to reactivate it. And that's what we're doing here. Redirect activation two. We pass in the arguments, we pass in the instance. And then there is some <laughs> magic happening here. Um, so this is one of the examples of first make it work, then make it pretty. Uh, this is not the easiest API to use, but it does work. And I'm hoping that in, in future versions, they will make it a bit easier to do. One method call should be enough. All right. Moving on to windowing. So for uh, UWP developers, windowing has long been a very sore point uh, because of the fact that you could simply not have two windows in one running application. Um, because of the mobile routes that UWP used to have. So that's fixed. Um, and not only that, we also get much more fine-grained control over the window that we do have. For example, we can set the window title to something completely different. Or we can uh, create a custom one. So this is a fully custom title bar now. This is, and I will show you the code in a minute. This is a normal XAML control. This is a XAML grid or stack layout, I don't know by art, um, that is set as uh, on the top of the page of, or the uh, window, and that is set in blue. This is not a title bar, it's a XAML control, which of course reacts to drag uh, events because you need to be able to drag your window around, which we are now ourselves are responsible for since we decided to use a custom title bar. The one thing that is not included in the custom title bar are the controls on the top right, the minimize, maximize, close buttons. Uh, those are always there and we cannot hide them because we need that control. Uh, unless you go full screen, of course. Let's reset the title bar, there we go. And then there's something called presenters. Uh, presenters are specific views for your application that you can switch to. For example, we can go to a compact overlay view, which minimizes our application. Um, an example of where this would be used is um, applications that show video. If you minimize an application like that, what you often get uh, in the bottom right is a small overlay that is still playing the video. Think Facebook, for example. If you start playing a video, you start scrolling down, the video starts playing in a small mini player. That's a compact overlay mode. Or we can go to full screen, which is perfect for when you're building a kiosk kind of application. Okay, uh, let's see what we have. 
Um, first of all, they are making use of an extension on the window class um, in order to get a handle for the specific window. Uh, so that's this. Uh, that's included in the sample that's on GitHub uh, from Microsoft. Can come in handy. Uh, so feel free to borrow this from them. Uh, going to the main page. Uh, main page being. Uh, the title bar. Let's start with the title bar in XAML. Uh, so this is our custom. No, it's not a custom title bar. Uh, it's in the window somewhere. Uh, on the page. Here it is. Uh, this grid is our custom title bar that we can toggle on or off should we want to. Um, okay, so this is for branding the title bar. First we check, is customization supported? Why do we need to do this? Because this is a Windows 11 only feature. Um, if you go back to Windows 10, uh, which is WinUI supported, you cannot do this. Um, there are a couple of other APIs in there, not too many, uh, where there's a, a difference between what's possible in Windows 11 and Windows 10. So always check for those. Uh, if customization is supported, we can take our main app window um, and use the title bar, foreground, background colors, inactive colors, and so on, to set some customization. This is just your basic coloring and text. This has nothing to do with a completely custom title bar. Um, this is the reset back to default. This is the custom title bar. So we toggle the visibility to visible. Um, we set some colors on there. We set a drag region. Um, in order to be able to drag it around. Um, this is a bunch of calculations on X and Y and, and how to move the window around. Ah, I can see it. Okay, uh, so moving the window around um, is also possible now, which wasn't for, for a long time. I believe we can even resize it. There we go. Uh, let's say we want 100 by 100 pixels. Resize. There we go. Not too readable anymore. But that's also something that was in high demand for developers back in UWP and just didn't exist. Any questions so far? Nothing? That means my explanation is perfectly clear. Okay. Um, jumping back to um, the app 5 I created um, a minute ago. Uh, let's put some things in here. We already have a button. Uh, let's add a text block like that and go to here. Um, so a bunch of you already did WPF, right? Who is not familiar with the binding framework, with doing bindings? Anyone not familiar with it? Perfect. Uh, so then we can go a bit faster. I'm adding a counter here. Every time the button is clicked, I'm going to increase the count. Um, so, if we want to do bindings, first thing we need to do is set the data context, right? Uh, I want to bind the text box text I got in XAML to my counter property right here. Okay, no problem, let's add data context, which doesn't exist on my window. Because in WinUI 3, window is no longer a framework element. So, in order to work around that, uh, we can set a name to our root element. Let's call it root, for example. 
And now we can set root.dataContext to this. And this works. Now my data context is set. I will explain in a minute why this no longer matters. Right? I'm just going to do it the old-fashioned way first. Uh, so we have a text. We add a binding to counter. Okay, so you all know how bindings work, so you also all know that we need the I notify property changed. Because we need to notify our UI that a certain element has changed in order for it to update. Okay, I have ReSharper installed, that does a bit of magic on I notify property changed, like allowing me to change the property to one with a change notification. There we go. So, uh, if I now run this, and if I'm going too fast or, or you missed something, uh, feel free to talk to me afterwards. My binding works. Every time I click, it updates the <laughs> exciting demo. So, um, now, why doesn't this matter anymore? Because instead of binding, in WinUI, we have adopted the XBind framework from UWP. So instead of setting a binding statement, um, and let's just switch this up to vertical and copy this. Instead of binding, we can now do XBind. What's the big difference? Uh, binding is a classic framework. It's still in here because of backwards compatibility. But these bindings were interpreted at runtime. Meaning, if I make a typo like this, my application compiles and runs fine. The binding just doesn't work. And now they have a binding failure pane in, in Visual Studio, but there used to be a time where you had to go look through the output in order for, for it to find out. I see some guys nodding, yeah. Um, with XBind, that's no longer the case because XBind are compiled bindings. Meaning that if I make a typo here, I compile my application. It already has a red squiggly. I get an error saying the property was not found in type main window. These uh, binding statements are compiled. Uh, the downside, so to speak, is that it has no data context. The concept of data context does not exist. The data context for XBind is always itself. So in order for, it, for um, using MVVM uh, patterns in, in these types of application, you need to have a property uh, of type of your view model in your code behind so you can use that to get to your view model. So you do XBind uh, view model dot counter, for example. The big, big upside is that we get full IntelliSense in our bindings, which is awesome. One more thing to look out for when going to XBind. And this is really a deja vu for me, because back when this was introduced in UWP, I did the exact same demos. It's like six, seven years ago by now, something like that. Okay, so the zero you're seeing here is probably uh, there's one missing. Okay. This is the XBind one. You don't see it updating. That is because in XBind, um, in bindings, you can set a uh, binding mode. You have one time binding, one way binding, two way binding, right? The default for XBind is one time. Because um, statistics have proven to Microsoft, apparently, that um, a lot of the bindings that are one-way or two-way shouldn't need to be because they are never updated. That's why they are defaulting it to one time. Meaning, if you have a, a case like this, like ours, where you need to update an element, you need to manually set it to one-way. If we run this now, Now it works again. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, 
The bindings, uh, the compiled bindings are way faster than the interpreted ones, which you can imagine, of course. Uh, but you need to keep these, these two things in mind, the data context and the default binding modes. Those are important. All right, moving on. Uh, so I've mentioned, uh, back when we were still doing the slides, uh, that we can do XAML islands, right? Using WinUI 2, we can embed um, newer controls in older applications. And I have something to show you from that side. Um, if you've ever seen my uh, introducing .NET Core 3 or .NET 5 or .NET 6 talks, this, you will recognize this demo. This is a small WinForms application. Um, what it does is not that, that much of importance, but let's, let me show you anyway. It loads an image and it converts it into pixels. Which was fun back when we were doing a post-it war with uh, the Java team at our company. Uh, they never knew how we did it, but this was our magic trick. Um, the interesting thing here is, is that this is an old WinForms application. It was written in .NET 4. For sake of the demo, I've updated it to uh, .NET 4.8. So we're still on 4.8. Not .NET Core, not .NET 5 or 6. Uh, there is a web demo here, which basically loads html5test.com into a browser control that is now telling me you are running IE 11 on Windows 8, uh, which I can tell you is not true. Uh, I'm running on Windows 11, which is not always a good thing. Okay, so in order to fix this, I need to replace my... Um, let me show you the framework while, while we're at it. Just to prove that I'm not lying for the late. Uh, I need to replace the web view that's in there, which is the default web view in WinForms, which is in the toolbox. I need to replace this with the more modern one. So to do this, I go to NuGet. And I go looking for Microsoft.web.webview2. I believe it was. There we go. So this is the new web view uh, based on the new modern edge, which is based on Chromium. I install this into the project. There we go. Let's see if we can still build it. But succeed it. I open up my web view form, delete the web view. Now if I go into the toolbox, there should be a web view to control, which I can just drag onto the surface. I'm not gonna bother too much with laying it out, just like this. I go to its properties and I set the source to html5test.com, which is not valid. There we go. Save it, run it. Oh, right. Uh, this is uh, for, from the old one to set the URL. There we go. Let's jump to here. It now says I'm using Edge 101 on Windows 10, which is not entirely correct. Uh, I think HTML5 test, uh, HTML5test.com does not know how to interpret the agent string for Windows 11 yet. Uh, but at least it's closer to what I'm actually running, right? Uh, so this was one NuGet package that contains WebView 2, but it is based on the XAML Islands technology. If you want to embed other uh, controls like, like the inking canvas and so on, um, the the setup of this, of being able to use uh, XAML controls with XAML islands in WinForms WPF, the setup is a bit more involved than this. Um, they've extracted this one and put it in one package because it's one of the most requested ones. Um, but there, there is an entire walkthrough on, uh, on the documentation. All 
All right, let's jump back to some slides. We've reached the point where our application is finished and we need to deploy it to our customers. Yay, exciting times. Uh, we can do two, th two things. Um, well, actually, for now, we can do only one thing. We can do framework dependent, meaning that the version of .NET and the Windows app SDK that we are depending on needs to be installed on the user system. That's a given. We cannot go past that. Um, if you've been looking into .NET 6 and its different deployment modes, uh, you know that we can package applications, including uh, the framework itself. This is not possible for Windows App SDK right now, but it is in the 1.1 preview. So the next version will have it. Have you ever used one of these? These are all now replaced by MSIX. At least this was the marketing story uh, used by Microsoft to sell MSIX. Um, it has its issues, but it has some really good ideas as well. Um, the most in interesting one is that if you install an application through MSIX, your application gets a virtual registry and a virtual file system instead of the actual one. Meaning that if you decide to uninstall it, those virtual file systems and registries gets removed as well. Meaning you have no longer the case of machine rot. Machine rot, we've all been there. You, you've been using your Windows machine for a while. It starts to get slower and slower and slower. That's because all the applications you're uninstalling are leaving traces behind in the file system, in the registry, and so on. And all of these things need to get loaded as soon as your operating system loads. So that's what they're trying to solve with MSIX. Of course, this only works if every application uses this system, which is not the case right now. How can we distribute this? Uh, you can go through the Microsoft Store with your MSIX files. That is still a thing. You can put your applications on there, even your WinForms and WPF apps. I think one of the best known cases of Win32 apps on the store is Paint.net. It's on there. Um, and it gets updates uh, completely transparent from you. Uh, you can go through a file share or even an HTTPS web uh, endpoint on the web. Um, Azure static web apps can serve MSIX files for you. And basically you can, you can put it anywhere. So what are your packaging options? Um, you can go for MSIX, which creates a package identity and comes with some limitations. Um, you need your package identity for a couple of specific features. Like, uh, you, you remember the, the jump lists? If you right click on Word, you get your latest uh, or your most recent used files. For that, you need a package identity in order to do that. Um, the limitations that apply um, are in a sense that you cannot do services through those kinds of apps, like Windows services. Or you cannot do inter-process communications. Um, and if you're going through the Microsoft Store, you cannot get elevated access for your application. So those are the limitations that apply. And you only run into those if you have really specific needs in your application. Your average enterprise level application will not need those. So limitations do apply, but mm, not that big a deal. If you go for sparse packaging, you have a little less restrictions than MSIX, but you also get an app identity, so you can use the jump lists and, and so on. Um, the thing is you need a bit more work in order to get the Windows app SDK working. You actually need to bootstrap it uh, using code in order to load in the SDK to get everything up and running and so on. Finally, you can go for no packaging, and then you're back in the old way of working with all the different installers. Then it's up to you to create an installer for your application, uh, configure it correctly, and so on. Um, no restrictions apply, but you also get no app identity, which might be a problem depending on what you want to do. Packaging. Um, once you decide that I want to go the MSIX route, you can go to uh, or you can decide two things. I want an MSIX or I want an AppX. Um, the difference is um, 
in, in the, the way that it's packaged. Um, I forgot what the actual difference is. I'll need to look it up, sorry. Um, the thing with the app package is that it's single architecture. So if you know that I want it to be an ARM64 or an x86 or x64 application, and only that one, then you can go for an app package. If you want to have multiple ones, I want my application to run on ARM devices on 32-bit, 64-bit, and so on, then you need an app bundle, which packages all those uh, binaries in one package. If you uh, want to upload to the store, submit your application to the store, then you need the upload file package. Okay, let's see how this works. Uh, don't have a lot of time left, but should be enough. Let's go back to our uh, app five. Oh, that's not it. App five is lighter. Let's use that one. There we go. Okay, so if we want to package this application up, ship it, uh, we can right click and go to package and publish. We can associate the app with the store and doing this means that you've, got, you've registered yourself as a publisher on the Microsoft store, you've created um, an app in the store and now you're going to associate this solution with that app record that you created. So the system knows that if you build this, that will be the place where people can download. We're not going to do that. We are going to create an app package. It wouldn't be Microsoft if we didn't get a nice wizard, right? Uh, so we are going for sideloading and we want to enable automatic updates. We can sign our app. Um, if you decide not to sign it, then they assume that you will have your own signing solution and your own certificates and so on. Um, you cannot distribute an unsigned package. It will not install on most systems. I can create a self-signed certificate here, just like this. I can even trust it on my local computer in order to test it. So I've now created a new certificate, self-signed. My computer trusts this. I can continue on. Uh, let's say I only want x64. Now it wants to know where the installer will be located. Uh, so I have my share, which does not exist, but that's okay. Uh, and then how often should it check for updates? Every time it runs, it's perfectly fine. Let's create it. So what it's doing now is it's building my application, it's packaging everything up, and it will create a nice package for me in a couple of seconds. Um, so not only does it generate a package, which we'll see in, in a second, it also generates a, a, a well, nice looking, it generates an HTML file that we can use to show to our users uh, in order to, to download the file. So th this thing is incredibly broken. So it's finished, right? It gives me an output location, uh, which is somewhere in the projects folder and so on and so on. If I click it, I go to my documents. So a bit broken. Uh, let's see, it's in the bin folder, x86, debug, and so on. Uh, opening file explorer. Bin, up, debug, this one, this one, app packages, that one. Uh, and here is my MSIX file. Uh, I did, did not create the HTML because we're running in debug. Or oh, we, we've created a debug file at least. That's a shame. Launching the MSIX, it says that the app is already installed. If it wasn't, it would uh, have an install button. It would install and we're done. This MSIX we can distribute because it's signed. Um, of course, in a real situation, you would sign it using an actual trusted certificate. Um, here it's self-signed, so okay. All right, wrapping up. How about that timing, right? 
So a couple of resources. Uh, this is the link to the official documentation of the Windows App SDK. Uh, documentation is actually quite good. So feel free to read it. Uh, go through the samples of which I've shown you a couple. Um, my book, Introducing .NET 6, has a part on the Windows App SDK in its desktop chapter. So definitely check that out if you're interested. And that supports me as well, so thank you. Um, huh, I did not finish this sentence. Okay, uh, if you decide, if you have a UWP application, which um, I believe not many of you do, if you do have one, uh, they offer you a guide to migrate that application to the Windows App SDK, um, which also has a, a table which this link points to. It has a comparison table on features that are in UWP or in the Windows App SDK and how compatible they are or not. Uh -huh. I mean, okay, so the question is, what's the real advantage of the Windows App SDK over WPF? Um, if, if we leave WinUI 3 out of the equation for now, uh, there is none. Because you will be able, and, and I haven't been able to do this, so I think it will be in the next version, you will be able to pull the Windows App SDK into a WPF app. I use all of its new modern APIs. That's what they're working towards. If you take WinUI 3 in there, um, that means you can use the modern controls. Like, um, like the, the, the UWP modern controls, you can use them in your WPF application. So it's a way of modernizing your existing app. Yes? Okay, so the question is, is um, how does this fit into MAUI, which all also have a desktop target, right? Uh, the desktop target of MAUI is actually WinUI 3. So that's how they fit together. Like, um, MAUI just compiles down to a specific platform, compiles down to Android, to iOS, or to WinUI. That's how it will work. It will be effectively the same as creating a Windows App SDK uh, version with that side effect that you can share your code with your mobile versions as well because of it's Maui. Good question. Any other questions? No? Awesome. So thank you very much. We've had the questions by now. Thank you. Glad you enjoyed it.